to this um, joint meeting of Chichester Humanists and Brighton Humanists. My name's Cass Sutherland and I'm chairing this meeting. And tonight we're going to discuss our relationship as humans uh, to our natural world and discuss what we ought to be doing as individuals and collectively to try and protect and nurture our environment from the multiple threats that it faces, which scientists say amount to an urgent crisis. And we've got two very distinguished speakers to talk to you about this tonight, who I'll introduce you to in a few minutes. No. Um, let me tell you about the two humanist groups. This is what they say about themselves. Chichester Humanists is proud to be a branch of Humanists UK. They provide a range of activities for non-religious people to meet, socialise, debate and support each other. And their events provide opportunities to meet and socialise in normal times, of course. Uh, with like-minded people to campaign on humanist and secularist issues, to learn, exchange ideas, volunteer and um, engage in other charitable work, to represent humanist and secularist views, to promote and celebrate scientific and rational thinking, and to promote humanism as a life stance and have fun. Brighton humanists have been at the centre of free, the, the free thinking community of Brighton for over 60 years and continuing this tradition, they support the community by advocating for a reasoned and ethical approach to life where th free thought and kindness can flourish. They believe that this is the way to a free and fair society. As individuals, they aim to live the best lives they can, and as a group, they strive to promote well-being for all. And Brighton Humanists is a partner group of Humanists UK. So let me tell you briefly why I was asked to, to chair this meeting. Um, I've been an environmental campaigner for many years, and I'm one of the volunteers on the steering committee, which has, for the last two years, been setting up Humanist Climate Action which is a section of Humanists UK and which is going to have its official launch on the 13th of May. So um, a group of about eight of us uh, started uh, discussing what humanist climate action should be and what it should be called even. And we came from with a very different set of ideas and backgrounds, but and it's a considerable achievement that we've actually managed to arrive at a, a common agreement and set of policies about what HCA should do and say. HCA should be encouraging non-religious people to play our, our role in making the change happen that is needed um, urgently if the prediction of climate set scientists are true or if the terrible predictions are to be avoided. Um, we had a range of, of, of opinions about um, what the emphasis should be. We, we've arrived at a consensus that contributing to public pressure on governments and corporations um, to make those changes and put those policies in place is a priority. So we encourage non-religious people, or we're going to encourage non-religious people to make their voice heard by politicians and people with power and influence. This doesn't have to be done by joining HCA. Uh, we're not saying that is the only road to, to Damascus. Um, people can join any campaign group that they feel comfortable with. It might be, um, protecting and developing their local nature reserve. It might be the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, which has been campaigning fantastically for many years on climate change. It might be Extinction Rebellion, Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, or a local campaign to save trees like the one that happened in Sheffield. But 
we encourage people to be part of what I think of as the environmental movement, which is creating the demand for change and which has already had a very big influence, but unfortunately not yet enough. Um, so we, how we live our individual lifestyles matters, uh, choosing to reduce meat consumption or reduce car travel or flights, for example, we, we have to practice what we preach. Um, and those lifestyles will create a new culture, which in the future will have to be the norm. However, the big international changes that are needed to the way we travel, manufacture, heat our homes, grow our food, fish, etc., can only be achieved by changes in international and national policies and laws. So that is, that's going to be the primary focus of humanist climate action. Um, and, I, and I would say, and this is more me um, talking than humanist climate action, that it's very obvious that politicians aren't, aren't going to make the changes that are needed by themselves, despite the government announcements this morning. Um, they're actually behind or on promises about the environment they've made in the last few years. Um, I think that only the mass pressure of the electorate of um, ordinary people uh, letting politicians know that that is what their voters want, that we want those changes to actually implement the policies, uh, not just make uh, headline grabbing announcements, only um, that pressure from the bottom up, uh, a peaceful movement of ordinary citizens will create the, the sufficient demand for change to make it actually happen. Now, let me introduce our two speakers. Firstly, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, Tony Whitbread. Uh, Tony is the former chief executive of Sussex Wildlife Trust and he's now their president. He's an ecologist who's been a national spokesperson on woodlands for the wildlife trusts. And being an early advocate of rewilding, his main interest is in landscape scale conservation and the functioning of ecosystems. Tony's written articles and reports on natural processes since the great storm of 1987 for British wildlife and in 1997 um, and uh, in numerous publications for Sussex Wildlife Trust. And this has driven a strong natural partnership between the Trust and NEP rewilding project, which Tony's also very involved in. And Tony's a regular speaker at conferences and on the radio. Paul Hannam is an author and psychologist and has worked in the environmental sector for over 20 years. He taught environmental management at Oxford University and he's had four books published. Paul is also co-chair of Greening Staining and gives regular talks on a wide range of green issues. In his professional work, Paul specialises in working with environmentally and socially responsible leaders who want to achieve both success and significance. And um, Paul and Tony have worked together uh, before. So now I'm going to hand over- I'll switch slides, there you go. A nice inspiring slide. You probably recognize it, one of the most famous photographs ever taken. Um, it was taken at the end of 1968, and it's called Earth Rising um, from Apollo 8. And when many people saw this photo, it fundamentally changed the way they saw our planet. It told a new story about our world. For the first time, we could really see our Earth's beauty and that we were a tiny, pale, blue, fragile dot floating in a potentially lifeless universe. And tonight I want to talk about stories and how we see uh, the world around us and the universe. And I want to talk about a really transformative story, the story about what it means to be human. Because as we look at Earth, we should be grateful, loving stewards, celebrating and caring for this extraordinary planet that gives us life. Maybe the only planet but where life is possible at all. 
But our dominant collective culture is based on a very different worldview, a very different story, a dysfunctional and toxic story about at best taking our earth for granted and at worst exploiting our majestic planet. And our talk tonight is really a tale of two stories. Our current story of neglecting our precious earth, of rampant growth, of climate breakdown. And we call it climate breakdown, not change, because that's what's happening. Change could be quite benign, breakdown is not. And it's also a story of ecological collapse and desperately need it. And we need a desperate uh, new story based on stewardship, on connection, on compassion, on regeneration and equity. But whichever story triumphs is going to really decide the future of humanity. So let's begin by really looking at the state of our planet. And Tony and I don't just want to talk about all the terrible facts. I'm sure you're aware of a lot of them, but I just want to highlight a few areas. Now, we're using climate breakdown because the climate is breaking down. For more than 10,000 years, we've had a relatively stable climate. But since the Industrial Revolution, that's all changed. Excuse me. So 2020 was the warmest year on record. Five of the last six years have been the hottest in recorded history. We've seen record temperatures in the Arctic Circle. We've seen Greenland ice melting at a, to a point of no return. We've seen record wildfires, wildfires in places like California, Siberia, Australia, and and something that could be worse than any of these, which isn't really covered in the news, is the Himalayan glaciers are beginning to melt. And that will affect over a billion people um, in Asia. So very worrying signs happening, and I'm sure you're aware of these. But I want to put up a slide that you might not have seen before, which really illustrates the bind that we're in. So this is really... Um, a book Going up is the amount of carbon parts per million, which has increased dramatically um, over the last 100 years. And we're now at around about 416 in 2021. But you'll also notice along the bottom is a graph. And these are all of all the years and all the big international agreements we've had. We had the WMO conference. We had James Hansen's testimony to Congress, where people suddenly realized the scale of a problem, the UN Climate Convention, all the way to the Paris Agreement of 2015. And this year we've got COP26, of course. And notice what's happened. All these agreements, yet yeah, the parts per million just keep on carrying up and up and up. And this is extremely worrying. And it really shows that knowledge does not lead to action. We've had the knowledge about the dangers and risks of climate breakdown for decades now, but the trend is only going in one direction. And let's hope that the agreements lead to real change and we can start to bring that curve down. Because the fact is greenhouse gases are at their highest level for 800,000 years. And if we carry on in this trajectory, we're really entering a disaster movie in which we are characters. And the fact is if we don't um, keep the limit to one and a half degrees for rise by 2030, we're in serious trouble and we could, this could lead to runaway climate change. So this is a point I really want, I, I want to get across tonight, is that we have to cut emissions by half in the next nine years. And if we don't, we will not hit our limit of maintaining the rises at one and a half degrees centigrade. So Think of those terms of cutting emissions by half in the next nine years, what that actually means in order to avert dangerous climate, uh, climate breakdown. I just want to talk for a moment about the cause of our crisis. I'm sure everybody here has their own view of what, how we ended up in this mess. Some people attribute it to overpopulation, others to excessive consumption, some to Western materialism. Many, of course, to fossil fuel industry and the lies that they've um, spewed out over the last decades, like the tobacco industry did in the 60s and 70s. But Tony and I and many other people believe the root cause of our problems is the collective human story that we're telling ourselves. Now, stories are very important. In my work as a psychologist, whether I'm working with individuals, groups, organisations, we all have stories that we tell ourselves. Uh, about how we feel, how we think, what our values are and how we act, where we've come from and where we're going. 
And we also have collective stories. And there's one big collective story that underpins globalism and our economic, social and political systems. And in terms of human history, this story is very recent. Its origins can be traced back to mass agriculture, but its dominance has really been established since the Industrial Revolution and has driven our, our political economy ever since. Now, sometimes this is called neoliberalism or Western capitalism, but it's really the source of our planetary crisis. It's a story of anthropocentrism, of human exceptionalism and entitlement. It's a story of reducing nature to atoms, that we live in a dead mechanical universe as opposed to a living system that many indigenous people believe in. It's a story of human self-interest and individuality. It's a story of endless growth and the conquest of nature with no respect to planetary limits. It's a story of exploitative capitalism and rampant corporatism. It's a story that our main purpose in life is to consume as much as we can and more stuff will make us happy and fulfilled. It's a story that GDP is the measure of a society, not the well-being or compassion or community. And the problem is this story is deeply flawed and it's leading to terrible consequences. The story is catastrophic for a world approaching 8 billion people living and working in a global economy based on fossil fuels. And over the next 20 or 30 years, if we don't change, we're going to see the collapse of agriculture. Did you know we've lost 40% of our topsoil in the last 50 years? This will lead to widespread famine, more and more droughts. Climate breakdown is also hurting the poorest and most vulnerable. It's, it's a significant uh, moral issue as well, because we don't distribute wealth uh, equitably. We have very damaging externalities, out of sight, out of mind. We don't see carbon dioxide. We don't see ocean acidification. We don't see our waste being exported. And this is going to lead to mass migration, and it's very harmful to our well-being too. So, you know, part of the problem really is, is this idea of corporates, corporations and profits have been absolutely dominant. It is the dominant value system of our world. Uh, David Corton wrote a beautiful book about 30 years ago called When Corporations Rule the World, and they really do. We're seeing it in football this week, we're seeing it in everything. And many millions are bought into this corporate worldview that we're selfish, competitive, status seeking, and that more wealth, more growth and more stuff is all we need. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. That is majority of people in the world, and certainly in the Western world. So what we desperately need is a new story. We have to write it as soon as possible and put humans first and put species first, not profit. We can't change science, we can't change our physical and biological limits, but we can change our values, we can change our culture, and we can change our story. For a story is written, it can be rewritten. And we need a story that prevents climate change and uh, climate breakdown and ecological collapse. And I think COVID-19 has been a real opportunity. Of course, it has been a disaster and catastrophic for the three million plus people who've died, but it's also been a chance to pause and reflect on our predicament. It's shown that there is another way in which we can live and that we can change our behavior on a massive scale when we feel it's urgent and we need to. It's proven with the vaccine, what we can do when business, science and governments come together. It's amazing what they've achieved and we need the same initiative and momentum for um, renewable technologies. And it's also highlighted the seeds of a new story. And we've seen it in our communities of empathy, collaboration, compassion, community, adaptability, flexibility and appreciation of nature. It's really highlighted what we call our better nature. So in order to stay within one and a half degrees and reduce our carbon emissions by 50%, we need a new story where our lifestyles change, we change our economy, we focus on degrowth rather than growth. We look at interesting models like donut economics from Kate Raworth at Oxford. Uh, we have to change our politics and our system and our core structure of civilization. We want to write a new story about living and acting from our better nature. And we hope that you will join us on our mission. Thank you. And over to Tony. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Thank you. Quite a lot there to think about. And what I want to pick up now is the uh, uh, is this human story that we tell ourselves so far, this presumption of human dominance, the presumption of human exceptionalism, uh, the presumption of never ending, uh, never ending economic growth. 
Now that has repercussions. There are direct mathematical realities when you think about um, continuous material growth. Now let's hover on that for a minute. Let's actually think what that actually means because we, we often don't think in those terms. Let's take the figure 3% growth per year. That seems to be what economists really think is the average we should be having for the world in terms of our economic growth. 3% economic growth a year doesn't sound much. That gives a doubling time of less than 25 years. So every 25 years, the size of your economy doubles. The size of the economy today is, tw is twice the size that it was in 1995. So we're using twice, if, if resource use is linked to, to the size of the economy, we are using twice as many resources now as we were in 1995. That's quite staggering, isn't it? But that's not the shocking statistic. The shocking statistic is the way doubling works. Be between 1995 and today, we have used as many resources as we did in the entire history of the human race before 1995. That's how exponential growth works. And we will do the same again before, before 2045. So between now and 2045, we will use as many resources as we did in the entire history of the human race before today. Now, there could be some good news in that, that, that what we all rely on is decoupling. So we get economic growth, which doesn't rely on increased resource use. And this does seem to be happening in some countries. But I'm very suspicious that actually there doesn't seem to be what's happening globally. And I think actually what's happening is we're exporting our problems. Britain seems to be achieving that, for example. I think we're exporting our problems uh, to other countries, importing the resources and the manufactured goods from other countries. Overall, this is how the doubling seems to be work. We, we, we are using resources and creating pollution at an ever increasing rate. And this is, is mindless. We can't carry on like this. Another good figure as we talked about climate breakdown. Uh, we signed the Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. Great. And we were going to solve climate change in 1992. But what happened? Since 1992, we have emitted more carbon dioxide than the entire history of the human race before 1992. We haven't done it, as, as Paul showed with those, those, those graphs. Um, and this has inevitable impacts on Earth systems. It's not just a nice to have, it's not just a pity, it's not just the lack of a few animals that some animal huggers might like. It has an effect, impact on Earth systems. We've heard about the climate emergency. We're in the, an ecological emergency as well. The Intergovernment Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services a name that rolls off the tongue, that estimates that there are one million species at risk of extinction. I think we only know about 10 million species, so that's a lot. A lot of scientists now think we're at the beginning of the, of the Earth's sixth mass extinction. The last one saw off the dinosaurs. Now that's how big the size of the crisis is today. Some statistics, there's loads of st statistics we could quote, but let's look at the, the mass, the volume, the, the weight of all the mammals on Earth. So take all the mammals on Earth. 96% uh, of, of the mammals, 96% of the biomass of mammals on Earth are either humans or are livestock. Only 4% is everything else. Only 4% for all the elephants, all the kangaroos, all the badgers, all the mice, everything else is either humans or are livestock. That's how much we're dominating the planet. Think about insects. Uh, insect populations around the globe have crashed in the last 30, 20 or 30 years. One study in Germany showed 75% reduction in biomass of insects, and that was in protected areas. Apparently there's a forest where, where the work was done in Costa Rica, 90% reduction. So we're seeing all these problems. And it doesn't, as I said, it's not just a shame, this is affecting earth systems. We are losing soil. We are losing the productive capacity of the soil. That soil is going down, down, down rivers and ending up in the sea, where it's causing dead zones, where it, large areas of the sea are no longer productive because of this. We have crises when it comes to pollination. There are now regions in China where, where farmers are having to hand pollinate crops because there's no insects. Uh, and of course, we're seeing pandemic emergence, another sign of the breakdown of our relationship with nature. We are part of nature. We rely 100% on Earth systems. We cannot pretend otherwise. It's deluded to pretend otherwise. Think of carbon dioxide. Before life evolved, the Earth's atmosphere was at least 90% carbon dioxide. Two billion years ago, 90% carbon dioxide. Today, it should be 0.03%. And that's maintained at that level by life and nothing else. Life maintains these sorts of conditions. It's the same with oxygen. As far as we know, there's no other free oxygen on planets in the known universe. It's only here. Water cycling, nutrient cycling, all these sorts of things, they are, made, they are delivered by life. And we rely entirely on that. 
So we need a new story. As, as Paul has said, we need to change. We need to do, to do something differently. Quite often this is presented as stopping stuff or being hair shirt or something, but it's very, very different. Uh, this period in our history and our human history is aberrant. Uh, we think of ourselves as uniquely qualified to exploit and take uh, monetize nature and convert it into something for ourselves and never mind the consequences. That simply doesn't work. Last time we looked, the earth was round. It's finite. We can't have an infinite economic system based on a finite system. So we need to move our human story from one of exploitation, from one of human, uh, human dominance, human exceptionalism, to one which is based on regeneration. It's too late even to, to talk about sustainability. We need to talk about rebuilding, regenerating, a regenerative relationship with nature. Now, obviously, in a few minutes, we can't say what that actually means, but let's think of it, just a few kind of key words. I like the subject of rewilding. I've been playing with it for donkey's years, but the subject of rewilding is really grabbing the imagination now, I think, to rebuild, to put back those natural processes that we've been destroying for, for the last 10,000 years, put some of those back. Nature is vibrant. Nature can actually restore itself, given the chance. There are cases in Sussex. There are examples in Sussex. Uh, the chair mentioned the Nepa State, where rewilding is enabling nature to blossom and rebuild itself. We have another example off, off the coast in Sussex, uh, 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 along by Worthing, where we're regenerating or trying to regenerate kelp forests. Kelp forests, a natural system which locks up carbon 40 times as fast as, as, as terrestrial forests. So nature can regenerate itself if we actually give it the chance. So rewilding is one of those sorts of principles that we need to think about. Secondly, regenerative agriculture. We think of, of agriculture as perhaps being very damaging, which it has tended to be, but it can be incredibly building as well. And the whole principle of agriculture, which regenerates soils, not doesn't mine soils, agriculture which brings back biodiversity rather than rather than degrades it, which rebuilds hydrological systems, which brings back the pollinators. That is all possible, and that is being done all over the world, including in Sussex. So turning the corner, thinking about things which are regenerative rather than damaging. And again, as Paul said, we need an economy that supports this. We cannot just have an economy which relies on capitalising or monetizing nature and using it for some temporary, rather trite human benefit. We need to change our economy around. We need to actually refocus our economy, rewrite the economic compass. And it's not just a weird econ ecologist like me that says that. Prof professor Dasgupta, a Cambridge professor of economics, uh, contracted by the, by the government's treasury department, has said exactly the same thing. Our economic compass is faulty. We need to rewrite it. We need to value in natural capital and in a, in a realistic way, rather than the way it's sometimes presented. Natural capital is the, is the dominant form of capital. Everything else relies on that. We can't trade it. We can't trade it away. Uh, a lot of these things are, you know, are, are a given. We can't just get rid of it. So natural capital, valuing natural capital properly, valuing it for its, actual, for its proper services and, and, and growing natural capital is something that our, our, our new economy will have to do. So we need to change. We need to change from our, the picture of ourselves as consumers um, we, are, we can't judge ourselves by the size of our flat, team, flat screen telly or how shiny our car is. We need to value ourselves in other ways. We need, need to become citizens again, not takers, but contributors, contributing to society, not just taking from it. In practice, when you, look, when you, when you analyze people's brains, they get more, more pleasure from actually contributing than they do from receiving. So it's not just about taking, it's not just about exploiting, it's not just about human exceptionalism, it's about becoming a citizen becoming a contributor to society. And again, as Paul said, I think the pandemic has really opened this up in people. According to the horror movies, we should have all turned into flesh-eating monsters when, when, when we were under pressure. That's not what happened. We turned, overall, we turned into fine citizens. I know there are exceptions, but they were notable because they are exceptions. Around the world, people turned back into fine citizens, helping each other out, and in particular, um, I think, what, what happened was the, um, the way we applied this locally. I think local actions was the key thing. And I want to end now with a quote. And the quote is, you, don't, you make a living out of what you get, but you make a life out of what you give. Now, what, which radical environmentalist said that? It was Sir Winston Churchill. I now hand back to Kath. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so... Uh, Paul and Tony are now going to uh, just have a bit of a, a discussion. So um, could I ask um, 
a question to Paul, just to get the ball rolling. Um, Paul, you set out very vividly and clearly how our values are, and our systems and are wrong and are leading society in the wrong direction. What do you see as ways of trying to achieve the changes that you feel are needed? Well, I think we have to work literally at every level, as individuals, families, communities, as employees, as businesses, uh, for parties. We have to put pressure from bottom up because top down has, I mean, I've worked in this field for nearly 25 years, Tony Longo, we both know that we've, we knew about this 25, 30 years ago. Um, and it's not been enough. Governments have not been able to seize the day and do it. So I think we need a massive movement. We need groups like XR. We need groups like Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, the Green Party, but also lots of local groups. So Tony and I work in local groups that are coming together. And it's helping people make connections between their health, their family, um, their community, jobs, quality of life, pollution, the landscape and making these connections, putting these pieces together and then campaigning to have the, the communities and the societies they want. Unfortunately, knowledge does not seem to be enough. And what's happening at the moment is people watch a David Attenborough programme and get very excited, very inspired, very emotional, but then nothing really happens. They just go back to default mode, which is the system I talked about, the story I talked about now. But we, I think we just have to, we have to work together. On our own, we're not going to do it. But if we're parts of groups like Tony and I, part of, and Viv, then, and you are as humanists, you know, collectively groups coming together, I think we can do it. But we have to change everything. That's the problem. It's unprecedented in history. So there is no easy answer, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. And uh, Tony, have you got anything to add to that about how we get to we try to move from where we are to where we want to be. Well, yes, I mean, I very much support what Paul says. We do have to work on every level. But so uh, in, my, in my job and in, in, in my past, the, th the, the place that people really associate most, most with is their local group, their local environment, their local, local place. And I think, uh, yes, you have to work at every level, but that's a good place to start. Um, and I think that also came out during the time of the pandemic. People were clearly valuing their local place, their local people, their local community. And uh, people who didn't, didn't know me at all were talking to me about the wildlife they'd seen in the, during their daily exercise. People were starting to notice their local nature. There was a bit of a myth that nature blossomed last year when, because we were all locked up inside. Well, it probably started to occupy the spaces we'd left, but actually what happened was people were starting to notice nature. Now, starting to actually realise that this is actually really important. We need to look after this for no, for no other reason that it's really quite nice. So I, I think, you know, this, this whole thing about at least starting off locally, recognising your local nature, recognising your local groups, how you can work with your local groups, how you can actually contribute something. Join a group for not, not for what you can get out of it, but for what you can put into it. And then you'll get more out of it. But actually also, to, once you're in, in groups, you can then work together and you can then start to... Well, you've then got the credibility to actually make pressure at a higher level as well. So it actually, it, you know, this should be a, a whole is greater than the sum of the parts thing. OK, well, thank you very much. And just to, to build on that question of how change is achieved, do you think that given the, the um, sometimes, you know, rather unpopular changes that might be needed to lifestyles uh, to get to the, the, redu the zero carbon emissions. Mm. Do you think that we can achieve um, a zero carbon society without social justice, what's called social justice? In other words, a, a package of social measures to go with the uh, changes to um, the way we fuel ourselves, our, our carbon output. Well yeah, I mean, for, from my perspective, um, I think it's worth looking at the United Nations uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, because what they do is weave together sort of social, economic, political and environmental goals. And the two, they are inextricable. We have to look at a wholesale redesign of how we live. Now, a lot of people will call that socialism or revolution. That's down to them. But we're not we're being impelled and forced by by the science. And we have we have to really make uh, those massive changes. But what I'm interested in, um, my work in psychology, is the fact that 
there is a huge amount of evidence that the link between happiness and money is a complete myth. The happiest countries in the world are not happy because they have the highest standard of living. They're the happiest because they have the most equality. If you look at Scandinavian countries, the gap between rich and poor is dramatically lower than it is in the UK or the States or Canada or Australia. And they're far more cohesive countries. They're countries where um, you have you pay higher taxes, but you have a great health service, great education, uh, great you know, paternalistic approach, looking after the people, community is much stronger. And that's where we're going to build on the real sources of happiness, not the mythical sources of happiness. I think there's something in your question about equity. Can we achieve these changes that are necessary? Um, what, you know, if we don't achieve, don't do it in an equitable way? And I think the answer is no, we can't. And we've seen examples of where this has gone horribly wrong, like the, um, what they call the Green Vest uh, whatever it was in French, in, in France, when they, the Green Vest people responded to, a, I think it was change in field duty or something. Um, what we, we sometimes see is the pressures from changes being forced upon the people who can least afford to, to make the changes. And it needs to be the other way around. Yes, we're all going to have to change, but some people are going to have to change more than others. And unfortunately, maybe fortunately, that's going to be the rich. The richest part of society are going to have to change most. We can't just make this all, all the... Um, the problem for the poorest in society, because that's where we are at the moment. The problems of climate change, the problems of ecological breakdown, they're all going to impinge the poorest worst. Um, and the answer can't be to therefore make it all their problem once again in some of the answers. So we need to make changes, but it does need to be equitable. And actually, if we don't make those two things marry up, then we'll end up with, with protests against the changes that are necessary. So the two have to be um, finally, finally tuned together. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, just um, looking at some of the predictions you've made for, um, about the breakdown happening over the coming decades, um, what do you see as the kind of most um, dramatic or impactful uh, implications for, uh, for our lives as humans? I mean, do you see food shortages as the first thing that will really cause serious problems or... It's funny, 20 years ago, um, I gave a talk um, saying that the biggest cause of wars in this century would be environmental. A lot of people looked at me and thought I was mad. Um, but I think we're going to see mass migration on such a massive scale due to drought, due to famine, due to environmental um, disasters, that we will see hundreds of millions of people, potentially a billion people, moving around which will dislocate societies cause massive upheaval and massive wars and i think that will be one of the biggest areas we're going to have more extreme weather events but unfortunately that's going to affect the very poorest and most vulnerable the most but climate breakdown isn't just about getting or climate change isn't just about getting warmer it's about having far more extreme weather events. And the whole world's food system is based on predictability and stable climate. That's the breakdown and that's a huge danger that would undermine society. Uh, and there's so many disastrous scenarios we could be here all night, but I won't, don't want to be too depressing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'd agree with that. I, I, I see the um, uh, mass migration as, as going to be a, a major thing um, all around the world, but it'll impact everywhere. And by the time we see it, we, you know, the worst situation will be we'll have forgotten all about the ecological breakdown. We'll be blaming other cultures in one way or another. And I think I want to change the tone here, change the frame slightly by saying um, there's a difference between prediction and projection. Uh, projection is looking at this, what we have now, looking at scenarios, what we have and projecting them forward and seeing where you end up. Now, that is absolutely dire. If we take a projection of where we are at the moment, the feeble efforts we've, that we've done to, to, uh, to address this problem, we end up in the worst place possible. Project prediction is very different. What do we, we actually think might happen? Well, I think because those projections are so bad, the prediction is that we are going to do something about it. Uh, we're not going to be stuck on this track forever. We are, we are going to be changing this. And I think uh, my prediction would be that actually we'll start to see these things increasingly um, addressed in one way or another, it'll start to become much more something that we do. Now, yeah, okay, we're seeing governments everywhere saying wonderful things. They've always said wonderful things. Um, they're not meeting the targets they've said so far, so why should they meet now? But they're not gonna get away with that forever. Uh, governments don't lead, people lead, governments follow them. So this is where I think it's important for us, you know, to actually change those projections into a prediction of change. 
Um, so I think this is this is what this is where the kind of bottom up should meet the top down. Yeah. I, can I add something? I've, I'm, it's not all doom and gloom. There's been some very positive events. Uh, the most important by far is the victory of Joe Biden, not just because Trump would have brought us all crashing down another four years there, but because Biden is the real thing when it comes to um, tackling tackling um, climate problems and ecological problems. He's investing literally uh, trillions of dollars in the green, they call it the Green New Deal, but in, in building infrastructure around renewable technology and changing the whole infrastructure of the US, primarily to create green jobs, this is true. But the deeper question, and one we've addressed in other talks, is that we need more than just reform of the system, we need to transform the system, we need a whole new system. And that's where the problem is, because there's so many vested interests out there. And I don't think reform of the current system will cut it in the end, but it will help in the short term. And can I, do you think that um, we'll reach a tipping point, not an, um, an environmental tipping point, but uh, a tipping point in human consciousness and culture and ways of seeing things where the problems uh, will be so apparent that people will start to be open to the, uh, the kind of ideas you're explaining? Well, can I just quit? Yes. <laughs> um, I think that one of the biggest problems we have from a psychological perspective with um, the climate is it's long term and it's abstract and we don't see the immediate effects. With COVID, we could see friends and family, we could see lockdown, we could see an immediate impact. There was a real sense of urgency. <clears throat> Unfortunately, for, for us living in the West, maybe not in, the, in poorer countries in the world or in countries where the temperatures are so extreme, but for us, we're not having that that short-term impact so we need to um in terms of a tipping point i'm not sure if we're going to see that in our lifetime i think our children and grandchildren might but there'll be various tipping points happening all over the world it won't just be one big event i don't think yeah just thinking about that because Thank um you. i think it's d difficult to to see let's call it a tipping point let's call it a paradigm shift where people shift their whole way of thinking about things um you can only see paradigm shifts in retrospect uh, we won't know it's happened until well after it's happened. I don't think anybody thought, uh, you know, at the time of the Renaissance or the, or the Great Enlightenment, nobody thought then, oh, isn't it great to be halfway through the Renaissance? We only knew about it in retrospect. Now, I wonder in 20 years time whether we might look back to about now and saying, actually, there was a shift then. Uh, it wasn't coming really from governments. They were saying stuff. But I'm starting to feel that um, the conversations I've been having for the last 30 or 40 years are starting to become mainstream. I was just a weirdo for most of those 40 years, but actually now it's starting to become mainstream. And what's also I've noticed is that it's starting to become everybody else's idea. Um, you know, I, 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 I didn't really see that before. You know, everyone's claiming to be an environmentalist. Everybody's claiming to be interested in this stuff. Um, that didn't happen before. I was just one of the weirdos. Yeah. So, you know, we, we may look back and see this is about the time when changes started to happen. Okay. I find it so amusing yet interesting when you look at advertising on the tv now how almost half the ads are green e-cars or we're reducing plastic i mean it's we've always called it greenwash i mean some of it's more than that but clearly it is as tony said the mainstream is starting to shift now well, thank you both very much. I've got a lot of other questions I would have liked to have asked you, but I think it's time we hand it over to everybody else. So um, I know that that uh, Kat and, uh, is going to feed me some questions, but meanwhile, I've jotted down a couple that I've just happened to notice in the chat. Um, I'm afraid I didn't take the names of the people that asked them. Uh, firstly, um, I think I know what you're going to say, but could you just um, comment on um, the government announcement last night that they're moving the um, target date for the reduction of CO2 to 80% of the 1990 level from 2050 to 2035? So uh, who wants to go first? Right, shall I go first? Yes, I mean, um, we're often asked about uh, government targets and government phrases. Um, I've been asked over the last 30 years. On the one hand, I think we could kind of, should kind of ignore them. They're always saying things like that. But on the, on the other hand, we should take them very seriously and say, therefore, these are the repercussions. This is what you need to do. So, yes, we can't just accept people standing on their hind legs and saying wise things. We've got to say, well, the actions have got to follow. And they haven't followed so far. 
We can't claim to be bringing forward the targets for climate change whilst spending at least 27 billion on new roads, whilst opening new airports, whilst opening coal mines in, in, in Cumbria, whilst funding uh, fossil fuel extraction elsewhere in the world and possibly here, actually in the very hills of Surrey and Sussex and also in the North Sea. You can't face both ways. The, the, you know, we may be at some sort of cusp now where a decision will have to be made. But you can't just say one thing whilst doing another. I, I, okay, thank you. And, uh, thank you. And another question, um, perhaps a good one for Paul, is uh, what is it, do you think, this is by Aaron, what is it that do you think makes people deny climate change and not face that truth? Well, I lived in the United States um, for 10 years and, and I think about a third of people there um, didn't believe in evolution and believed that the world was created 10,000 years ago and Genesis was a literal explanation. And the problem is, wherever you are in the world, there are always going to be people. We've seen it with the anti-vaxxers here and, and other people saying COVID is a, is a conspiracy. There'll always be people against it. I think that's that's that group, the extreme group, but a lot of people are overwhelmed. Some people are overwhelmed. Some people are in denial out of fear. Some people um, think it's somebody else's problem and it's not mine and I just want to get on with my life and my family and my, you know, earning money and making a living are, are what matters. But I think climate denial now is far rarer. Say when, when 20 years ago when Tony is, you know, and I were really... Um, very keen on this we were in a tiny tiny minority uh now the vast majority of people certainly in europe and more and more now in in canada in the us and other places around the world really get it but at, at the end of the day it's in knowing these facts are not the same as doing something about it and that's for me the biggest problem is how we turn knowledge into action information into real practical action and measurable results and also and governments have been woeful of that so yeah can, sorry, can I just add also some new fronts on the climate denial front as well, because actually we're seeing a slightly different agenda now, uh, not outright denial, but um, uh, attempts to add confusion, attempts to add uh, unsureness into something which is actually pretty sure. No science is ever settled. Uh, gravity isn't settled. We don't know about it. But try jumping off a cliff and claiming it doesn't exist. So science is never settled, trying to add confusion and also trying to add delay. We're not quite sure yet we need more science, that sort of thing. These are the new fronts in climate denial. People are starting to say, oh, yes, we believe it. But, you know, have we really got the details right? Should we really risk so much on this? And this is this is another form of denial. Yeah. So, so I say we need to look for these new fronts in denial. Thank you. OK, well, we've got lots of questions, so we'll move on. Um, Rebecca asks, how do you think we can start to tackle the socio-cultural messages that people are inundated with that make them believe that they need consumption to be happy and successful? And that's actually linked to another que uh, question in the chat, which is Tom asks if it's a problem that the advertising budgets of corporates will drown out the truth. Well, they're both quite complex questions. First of all, in terms of advertising budgets, yes, I mean, no question. I mean, the media is owned by a few very wealthy people. But what's interesting, um, I'm also a big football fan, and today is very illustrative because we all know about this Super League that was set up. What you might not know is that tonight, Chelsea and Manchester City have pulled out in response to fan reaction. Um, so it does show that if... I mean, football is far less important than, you know, what's happening to our environment. But when people come together and really coalesce, but they can overturn corporate uh, greed. So um, we need to get the same enthusiasm here. But what's happening with corporations is almost all of the big ones now are jumping onto the bandwagon. And we're going to see more of this advertising, more of these, quote, green products. What we really need is a very clear measurement system for knowing what's greenwash and what's real. And, um, and just as we know GDP is a very simple way to measure the economy, we need exactly the same for these new changes. Now, in terms of shifting people away from consumerism, that, again, is through education, in my view. It's through reviving things which really make us happy, like being in nature, like community. Church, even, you know, I know <laughs> we're this here, but a lot of people find through various spiritual beliefs a great deal of, of friendship and meaning and purpose and we all it's down to all of us find meaning and purpose 
I think education has to fundamentally change, though, because at the moment we're still out there producing consumers. That but universities are basically businesses these days. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Now we've got a, a good question from Bob. What would you like COP26 to achieve? So, do you want to start, Tony? Yeah, one word, something. Um, <laughs> that, would be, that would be nice. You, you saw the graph that, uh, that Paul presented earlier. Yeah, we've had lots of these meetings. Uh, yeah, very, very good people, all very sincere, I'm sure. But you look at that graph and you look at all the meetings and there's not been one dent in that graph. So it's got to produce something. This is our last best hope. So we can't just uh, make wise statements in advance and at the, at the time we got to see real change, real activity change. So it's got to achieve something. And what is the something? Uh, what, what is the activity which might, may achieve something? One bit of hope that I can see, which is way outside my area of expertise, is actually how the financial system is starting to pay attention. The, these, are, these are not nasty people who are out to destroy the world. Uh, there is, they're probably some of the smartest people on the planet, and they're starting to pick up the, uh, pick up the agenda now and look at how new economic systems can work to actually um, change the way we actually do finance. To, to actually help the environment rather than damage it. Now, I don't know what on earth I'm talking about, but actually I see the, the, I see the interest of the finance sector in trying to change that, that, the way that works. I see that as a, perhaps something that will help change on a larger scale. Okay, Paul? Yeah, I just want to add to that. Tony's hit a very important point. I saw another question about economics. Yes, we have to change the economic system, and that means divesting in fossil fuels, uh, it means um, changing carbon tax, changing carbon policy, but above all, building in externalities. So we're actually paying for the, you know, all the CO2 we're pumping out because it's not factored into the economy at the moment. When you do that, things will change rapidly. Yeah. OK, thank you. Now, I've got another uh, comment, which I think would is, is a question, but it's not given as a question. It's from Dave, and he's he's commenting on something both of you said is that which is that you have to work at all levels including the local um not he doesn't go as far as the personal but commenting on what tony said about working locally local is great but not going to be anywhere near enough local doesn't impact brazil russia china or the usa we need to set an example but we're tiny yeah what can i say other than yeah, it's completely right, isn't it? And actually, uh, to build on that even more, I'd say be beware of the con of it being all down to individual action um, or, e or even local, little local action. It's not. Yeah, this is important. We've got to do this. But actually, I think some of the big firms would be delighted if it was all down to us and they could get off the hook scot-free. No, we have to do a lot more. So actually, the biggest changes are going to have to happen high up. But actually, you know, it's still good to work locally. Uh, linking back to uh, one of the earlier questions and how we're going to change people. Um, I think quite often in the environment, we got it wrong in the past, saying how bad things were and how you're going to have to stop all those nice things in order to do nasty things. Uh, it's not a very good message. Um, the way we ought to be saying this is, is actually by presenting something which is much more fun, much nicer, much better, a better place to be than the th where we are at the moment. So not making something that you like worse, but make some, making something you haven't got better. Well, I saw it, saw it, um, it said somewhere, we are making enormous sacrifices for the sort of economy that we have now. We just don't actually appreciate that. So we're sacrificing to support the economy. It's not helping us. We need to move to a system where we're actually getting more benefit. Okay, thank you. Now, I've got another comment here, which is perhaps challenging uh, what you said. Was it Tony, I can't remember whether it's Tony or Paul, who, who said that Joe Biden being elected was the mm. single most important yeah. thing that happened. So Greg comments that. Yeah. I'm here in the States, so he's listening in from the States, welcome. And Biden isn't all on track to cut emissions in half in nine years. And he also refused to cancel the Dakota Access Pipeline. Better than Trump, yes, but we need Bernie Sanders to be truly on the right timeline. Now, what's your, well, would either of you like to comment? Let me get, well, one, I, I should comment was I was a member of the Democrats when I was living in the States. And um, I thought Dakota had been cancelled, but maybe I'm wrong. But I, first of all, I'm a, I was definitely voted Bernie Sanders, no question. But we have to look at the contrast. Trump was the worst possible leader, not just for the US, but for the whole world. He stymied and prevented and blocked any progress since Paris in 2015, pretty much. 
with Biden there, just the fact that Trump's gone, and I'm afraid, although I support Bernie Sanders, I'm pretty certain he wouldn't have beaten Trump, and most political commentators believe that. If you look at the actual states that he won, that's another argument. But Biden is, is doing a lot, in my view. He's put John Kerry in a central role. He's been meeting with the Chinese, and John Kerry is a very experienced man. He is investing uh, billions in um, changing the infrastructure, but of course he has to get it through this is Congress and the Senate, and that is not easy at the moment, so it's really complex. But above all, Biden will start to make changes globally. That's a big thing. Now Boris is getting more on board. Now other countries are coming, and I think, and Joe Biden has put COP26 as a priority. Can you imagine what Trump's view would have been of it? So it's, it's not perfect, I agree. There's a lot of work to do, and they might not hit the targets, but compared to what it could have been, my God. <laughs> Okay, okay, Not thanks. a phrase I should use here, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we've got another question here from Roz. Um, wh uh, when might it be compulsory for people to do the right thing rather than just to be encouraged? For example, stopping local communities concreting over gardens and destroying the ecosystem for essential insects. So. It is encouragement uh, the superior path to uh, legislation or compulsion? Yes, yeah, an interesting question. I mean, um, we automatically think towards, oh, that's the wrong thing. We must, make, we must force people to do the right thing. And even if we did that, it wouldn't stick, would it? Because people would fight against it. Um, I think, you know, there is a role for legislation. There is a role for actually saying, no, there are limits on what we do. But actually, um, there are loads of other ways of doing things as well. Financial messages, um, actually proper costing of things. Um, if we actually paid the full cost of uh, factory farming, for example, it would be far too expensive to do. If we paid the full cost of some of the some of the um, some of the energy producing um, methods that we have at the moment, if we paid the full costs of climate change. Whenever we bought a gallon of petrol, we wouldn't be able to afford petrol. So actually, paying the proper cost is probably a better way of doing it because at the moment. Um, many of the things we're doing and getting, we're getting something, but we're not paying the cost. Now, there's another name for that. It's called theft. Now, we're taking something without paying for it. Uh, so I think there's a lot in our economy which is actually very wrong. We can, we can probably not get all the way, but we can actually do a great deal by reconciling some of these, some of these, these problems. And I've heard somebody argue that actually we may not have had any economic growth at all for about the last 10 years because the hidden costs of the economy in terms of the way it's damaging the environment and therefore the real the hidden costs that's causing us outweigh any, any superficial economic growth that we actually measure. So we are hiding a lot of costs, costs and imagining that it's not there. Um, of course, we everything looks good if you only count things positively and you ignore the negative. And that's where we are. So I think a lot of what we need to do is about giving the right mechanisms. Um, I resist the idea of making everything into legislation. We probably do need to do more with legislation, but I think um, I'm careful about doing too much by force because somebody else could get in and force us to do the, the opposite. Yeah, and the Gilets jaunes movement in France is an mm -hmm. example of what can happen if you try and compel people too much and then you get a, a big reaction against those progressive measures. That was yeah. the phrase I was trying to think of earlier. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Well. Um, I think what we should do now is hand over uh, to uh, people who want to ask a question by uh, putting their hand up and then uh, asking their question themselves. Um, how do you feel about flat pack democracy as a way forward to um, encourage people to stand as their local climate alliance individual where groups can come together and maybe because it seems to me that businesses are making the changes that need to be made, but the councils, West Sussex, for instance, CDC, are just dragging their feet. They're just absolute dinosaurs, you know, to, to they talk, there's a lot of narrative, but there's very little action. So I'm just wondering what your feelings might be on that. Gosh, an interesting question. Yes. Um... Yeah, I've spent most of my working life trying to work with the uh, with the systems within the system. So, yes, working with local authorities, working with county councils, government departments, trying to work within the system and, and, and try to drive change. Um, and you feel that they are increasingly I feel we're getting a sympathetic ear. Increasingly, I feel that I'm talking to to sincere people. 
uh, we probably always have done, but now it seems to be much more mainstream. And yet you're right, the changes are very, very slow in actually coming. Uh, there's a kind of um, inertia to overcome. Uh, yes, we might do that, but we're locked into contracts for the next 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm not sure what the way through some of this is. Now, on occasions, uh, we may have to say, no, the system is not working. We need to do something else. Um, uh, maybe we get to a point and we say, well, no, actually, there is something much bigger or much more sudden that has to change. I think an example, um, uh, the use of peat in garden products. Um, uh, we're, still, we're still being told, yes, we're, we're investigating alternatives, et cetera, et cetera. We're having exactly the same conversation that we had 30 years ago. There is no change and there's no movement to change. It now needs to be banned, full stop. Now, we get to those sorts of situations where, where actually uh, movement is not being made. Now, you know, I've worked inside the system all my working life. Some people are now evolving, evolving isn't the right word, emerging, who are working outside the system and saying, no, this is not good enough. We need to get, get different sorts of change at a different sort of level. And good luck to them. I think actually, you know, there is a there is a need and a role for that sort of person, um, that, that, that sort of movement. So people like Extinction Rebellion, people like Greta Thunberg, uh, working outside the system saying, no, you have not delivered. We need something else. So, yes, I think we do need people working outside the system saying it's not working properly. Well, have you got uh, anything to add, Paul? Well, yeah, so I'm um, co-chair of Greening Stunning, which covers our little area of Sussex. And we've got really quite radical plans because what we're trying to do is bring, we're bringing together all the local groups and we also work with the Southeast Climate Alliance, which is an umbrella group of about, I don't know, Tony, what, 100, 100 groups, 50 to 100 groups. And there are these alliances forming. And I see one of our role as being a campaigning group to support green candidates to stop these huge developments, especially around Horsham at the moment, um, and, and really um, stand up for these issues. But on our own, our own little group, we can't do it. But we've, we've gone from 700 to 1,000 members in the last few months, which is pretty good for a small part of Sussex. There is an interest in this, but we've got to develop new structures to, to embrace and capture that, that enthusiasm and energy. And I don't think councils, <laughs> they're like the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of inertia. We've got one that says, what, what do you say to people who say that climate change is happening, but is not caused by a human a society? So the, the form of climate change denial, in fact. Um, who'd just, like just go to any website, go to the BBC, National Ge Geographic, any government site, any university, and you'll find the answer. It's absolutely uh, anthropogenic, and it's the connection between the growth of CO2 and carbon parts per million since the Industrial Revolution and rising temperatures, absolute exact. I mean, it, well, the evidence is so overwhelming. It's one of the most agreed parts of science. Um, I forget the exact number, it was 97 or 98%. And you've got to remember, there are scientists who were secretly employed by the fossil fuel companies um, to dissemble and, and uh, deceive people about the dangers, just as the tobacco companies mm -hmm. did. So any, any proper scientist will be, you know, support that. Yeah. And there, there are plenty of graphs which show um, all the natural causes for changing climate um, and none of them correlate with the graph that we're on now, whereas the only thing that does correlate is the increase of CO2 and other uh, climate gases um, that, that we're producing. So it's, it is a good question. It's the first question that ever should be asked is, OK, we see something. Is it down to, the, to natural causes? So it's a very good question. It's a question that was answered 40 years ago. Um, there is no correlation with natural causes. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Now, um, we've got a comment here, which is perhaps saying that uh, I think not, uh, not only uh, us speakers, but also perhaps some of the, the, the commentary is rather uh, critical of fellow human beings. So it, it, it's from uh, Stephen Milton, and it says it feels a bit d disdainful of humanity uh, to, uh, to be characterised well, the way we are characterizing them here. People have moved dramatically over the last few years as priorities are changing. Can, so can I say a few words? Can you hear me? Sorry, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I, I made that comment and what I'm thinking particularly of is my daughters who are in their 20s and their circle of friends and um, they certainly get it. Um, 
over the last 50 years, I've seen lots of change. You see it in many walks of life. Um, the City of London is already advising, or finally advising, I should say, that investing in companies that have lots of fossil fuels in their balance sheet is a complete waste of space because uh, they'll never be able to be used. And that's how our existing system, which is clearly not perfect, is actually making changes to it. And there are things, obviously we're all going for zero carbon emissions at some indeterminate date in the future, but that's not going to be enough. We actually have to start reducing it as well. And the, there are some really exciting experiments being done for uh, carbon dioxide capture out of the atmosphere. And if we were to spend something like 10% of the amount of money that we spend on armaments in this world each year, we could extract the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere very quickly. The, the problem always is that we've got a, a balance between the immediate pressures and the um, and, and the longer term interest, as I think, I can't remember if it was Paul or Tony who said it, you know, uh, there are some pressures which are short term. Over the last 30 years, the amount of absolute poverty in the world has actually gone down dramatically. So GDP growth on a global basis has taken people out of abject po poverty. Of course, we need a society that needs to be fairer because otherwise it implodes and that's you know, this isn't the first time we've gone into a society where it has been grossly inequitable. And I, I'm very optimistic that the political movement will be towards a greater degree of fairness. And that will also help. So that's where all of that comes from when I say I, I don't think we should be too pessimistic. Okay. Without Thank being you. complacent, of course. Yeah. Um, you made some very good points. Yeah, I just, I come back to this graph that yes, there's been developments. Yes, there's more awareness. Yes, there's more consciousness. Yes, the city of London is doing this and corporations doing that. And we've got renewable technologies and Teslas and everything, but the facts are inexorable and they're going up and the actual pace is increasing. And let me give you one thought about this. China, as many of you know, is one of the world leaders in renewable technology. They are investing trillions to become the leaders in renewable. They're, they're doing huge amounts of, of work in their infrastructure, in their cities. But did you know they build more new coal mines and plants every year than you have in the whole of the US? And that's the problem. The, you know, we have to look collectively at the big picture and measure what's happening. And until we can get this graph down behind us to flatten, we are in serious, serious trouble because we reach a point where we get runaway climate change and it's too late. Uh, you know, clearly you're right, but the world economy is a massive tanker mm -hmm. and it takes a while to turn. I was in Mongolia two years ago looking at one of the big coal mines there and their coal all gets supplied into China but the contract is only for five years because China knows damn well that after five years, they're not gonna be able to use it. Even though that particular coal mine has probably got reserves for about 30 years. Mm. It is complex. Um, I mean, China, India are still building huge amounts of coal mines and they're looking for cheap fossil fuels because for them, their highest value is still economic growth. China and India know their societies could collapse if they don't deliver this constant economic growth. Um, and that is a higher value to them than, than climate change at the moment. Now that might change and it is incredibly complex, I agree. Yeah. Can I just, just go from the very big to the very small as well because I come back to the pandemic and the comment I made earlier that, uh, you know, according to the horror stories, you know, as soon as society was put under pressure, we'd all collapse and we'd all be fighting each other and eating each other or something. That's not what happened. People did turn into fine human beings all around the world. Now we know there are exceptions, uh, but actually that's not generally the case. Ra around the world, communities automatically form themselves very often to look after their weakest members. I think there is a lot of humanity in humans and actually the way we set up society is kind of mitigated against the good side of humans. Now actually we can, we can change that. And I think one thing that's changed in the last year is the ability to challenge what it is to be human. Uh, mm. Two years ago, if we'd have said this stuff about you know, how we need to change human nature, we'd have just been laughed at. Yeah, very idealistic, doesn't happen. 
uh, whereas actually humans are not the competitive, aggressive, selfish beings that we're told we are. We are actually automatic community formers. We're automatically empathetic. We automatically help each other. And we automatically value our local spaces. And we always have been. Yes. <laughs> we always uh, have been. It's not that something is, that's new from the pandemic. We always have been that. Absolutely. In fact, for 200,000 years, about 190,000 years, that's what we were like. And it's only in the last 10,000 that we've wavered from it. I don't think we have. I think we're still there. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I'm an <Good> optimist. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We, we haven't got much time left, so can I just move on uh, to another question? This is a more uh, scientific question. Uh, from Dave, do we focus too much on CO2 and miss the massive importance of methane? So, I don't know, would Tony, do you want to take that? Well, yes, I think we probably do. There's a, lo a lot of things going on and methane is very important and often the figures are quoted are often wrong. Um, methane is 20 times as bad as carbon dioxide uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a greenhouse gas. Uh, that's averaged over 100 years, which isn't very useful. Um, methane is about 80 times as bad as, as carbon dioxide over a 20 year period. So it is very bad news. Um, the advantage and the reason for the difference of those, uh, those figures is because methane doesn't last very long in the atmosphere. And this is where there's some controversy about how bad methane is. But as far as I can see, it's pretty bad news. And uh, it's also a ticking time bomb. If temperatures go up too much, then we start to lose large amounts of methane from the, from the permafrost, for example. So this is what people are very worried about. Um, I'm not sure where the science is at the moment, but it's something that's really worth watching. Um, I, can I just finish with one very quick question from me, which is a, um, a practical question, because people talk a lot about the changes needed in agriculture and seem to talk a lot about going back to uh, mixed farming, uh, or, or more organic farming, but in fact a new form of agriculture which is spreading rapidly around the world is ver vertical farming, which allows a, a high amount of food to be produced in a very small space and releases a lot more land for rewilding. Would, have you got any comment to make about whether you're pro or anti vertical farming? Yeah, there, there are all sorts of uh, farming techniques, which I think people are, are playing with all around the world, not just here. I mean, I mentioned regenerative agriculture, which is quite a, a, a wide spectrum of things. Uh, forest gardening is another one. Forest food gardens, again, takes the kind of layered approach. Uh, permaculture has a similar approach as well. In fact, the way we do agriculture, um, where we do large scale ag agriculture at the moment is pretty inefficient. It doesn't make very good use of land. And if you actually cost in the amount of inputs as well, it's pretty inefficient. Um, even without the inputs, permaculture can often produce vastly more food per acre than on our most productive farms. So actually there are different ways of producing food. And I think some of these will, will, will become a lot more common. There's a lot of diversity in agriculture at the moment. Uh, even in Sussex, we have rewilding we know about. We have organic farming we know about. People are, are practicing no-till approaches which is a regenerative approach. So there's a lot that's actually going on on a reasonable scale. So I think actually there are plenty of farmers, certainly the area I know about, there are plenty of farmers who are looking at different approaches. So, so the answer I suppose is yes, there are better ways of doing things and we're gonna to have to find them. At the moment yeah. farming is looking to reduce its emissions, it's gonna to have to do even more than that and soak emissions up. Okay, thanks. We, did, did you want to add to that, Paul? Before? No, no, I bow to Tony, he's more expert in this area than me. That's <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, that's that's all we've got time for. So um, thank you very much to, to Tony and Paul. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion and, and I've certainly got a lot of things I'm going to pick up and do more reading about after, you know, a lot of new things I've heard.